and welcome to the Red Mountain Community Church podcast, where you can hear conversations with the people of Red Mountain Community Church as we pursue Jesus together. Each episode highlights what God is doing in someone's life or a specific theme in light of what God has revealed in the Bible. I'm Peter Franson from Spirit Blade Productions and your fellow seat warmer at Red Mountain Community Church. My co-host today is Della Zwick, our Director of Family Ministry. So, Della, what does that job mean? And in general, kind of what are you doing in directing at RMCC? Well, each day looks a little different, Peter. <laughs> so okay. I never know when I come in to work. It's usually coming alongside people who are going through difficult times in their lives, but it could be doing some administrative things, a uh, lot of visitation, a okay. lot of interacting with people. Okay. It's, that's what I was wondering. I, I mean, I... I like I, I feel like you should maybe have a different job title, but I mean I can't think of another one that doesn't sound kind of hard and depressing because yeah. I mean like uh, you know you are you are there you are the the person on the spot when people are going through some of the worst times in their lives. Right. Um, and in fact, you were on, you were a guest on the show. I don't know. Was Talking that, about the, I, those I know. heavy subjects, yes, right? <laughs> yes. And that to me is still like one of my most like memorable, just because I, my thoughts tend toward dark and toward heavy things and stuff. And so <laughs> when I, when, when we had that episode, I was like, oh man, I, I couldn't wait <laughs> to talk to you about all that stuff. And I enjoyed listening to it after. And I think I've listened to, to that one and maybe one other that was on a similar type of subject, you know, uh, multiple times. So right. really appreciate your perspective, your gifting to just kind of be in that space with, with people. And, and I'm, I'm curious, um, what part of your job, what would be one part of your job you really enjoy and kind of maybe feel energized potentially by, and what would be something that you find challenging about, you know, your day to day? I would say just interacting with people and hearing their stories and what God's doing in their lives. Um, the harder things are always when someone has lost a loved one. Yeah. Because that is a ministry of just presence, of just sitting with someone, because there's nothing in particular you can say. Yeah. And then you're trying to pace with the Holy Spirit to figure out how best to minister to that person and how to draw the church community around them, too. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that that we have you doing that work and having you've been doing it. I mean, really faithfully. How long have you been doing that kind of ministry at Red Mountain now? I'm trying to think. Almost 15 years. Yeah. My gosh. Yeah. 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 So thank you for that. Um, okay. So we've been getting for the last run of episodes now for a while now um, a, an irresistible question for me to ask. <laughs> Because the stuff I came up with was way, way too weird. And so they, they nipped that in the bud. And came <laughs> These are the ones that are acceptable. So, yeah, I guess so, yeah. So the irresistible question this time is, what's something that has become more clear to you as you've gotten older? Let me think. Just the first thing that pops in your mind. How I need to recharge and oh. do some things that uh, just bring me closer to the Lord. For me, it's been learning uh, to play the piano again. Oh, really? Yeah. So I love playing hymns and focusing on their meaning and everything. Um, I love to bake, things oh. like that. So it's been more important, I think, to realize it's a marathon and not a sprint. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's maybe a little bit of a tendency for you to kind of go too hard and you have to, so yeah. you have to kind of discipline in rest. And just kind of like make it more a part of your life. Okay. A yeah. more natural part of your life. Yeah. Just so you're like focusing back and forth between here are things I do, but then here's my work and yeah. just kind of bringing that all together. Yeah. I don't have that problem. I am what, uh, what the clinicians call lazy. And so, <laughs> so I tend to just naturally build in rest I, and I, I recreation. I envy that actually. <laughs> do you really? I do, yes. Oh, man. <laughs> um, I think for me, something that's become more clear as I've gotten older well, I just turned 44, and so since about, I don't know, 38 or 39, it's just become more clear I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah. Know? I remember <laughs> around that age starting to, to feel that way. And not everyone is around their 40s, oh, but really? I did in my 40s. And now that I'm in my late 50s, it's like you definitely think about that. But once you come to peace with that, then it's like it's so much easier. It's mm. like you can live in a more peaceful way, I've yeah. I Yeah. I do think that, like, it's... I've 
past maybe a spike. I, I'm anticipating that maybe another one will come when I hit that and I'll get close to 50 or something mm-hmm. like that. But I, f- I feel like at this point in my life, it's I've, I've never had, and I, I don't know that I will have, you know, like a midlife crisis. Crisis feels like too strong of a word. But I've for a while now had what I call a midlife sobering. You know, mm-hmm. where it's just like there's a there's a sobriety, you know, and uh, and just that 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 realization that you know this is really my death is really going to happen. Yes. It's really going to be a thing that happens, yeah. you know, and uh, and then thinking you know beyond that to the promises that God has given me and the 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 light that that sheds on all these other areas of life. Some of which um, I'm grateful are less concerning. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But yeah, I find that as I get older, just the promises that we have and that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for mm. us, and what that's actually going to be like, mm. and thinking about how you know where your treasure is, yeah. you know, that's where your heart is. Yeah, I find myself going more to that place. Mm. But I do think that your word for it is like being more sober about it is an important one. Mm. It's not so much like a crisis when you have belief. It's more just yeah. like, this is a reality. And yeah. so in light of that reality, how do I want to spend whatever remaining time I have here? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, well, you can message us on Instagram. There's no transition from that. Talking about <laughs> the sobering. <laughs> how, of, how do you bring that one down? <laughs> no, good gravy. <laughs> Uh, but if you want to suggest something else for us to talk about, uh, you can message us on Instagram or Facebook with suggestions for fun things that we could do <laughs> or talk about before the interview. But for now, we are going to move things along. Uh, just a little while ago, Della and I spent some time talking with Sandy Bruton just about uh, some uh, events in her life and how God used those events and some people to really shape her into the servant that she is today. So it was a, a wonderful conversation, and here it is for you now. All right. Well, Sandy, thank you so much for doing this. I've been looking forward to this. I don't, uh, a lot of times when we have people on the, the podcast, I've, I maybe have seen their faces in the hallway, but I've had no interaction with them before. <laughs> and you're someone that certainly I have interaction with, but you're like on the list of people that like, I know the least considering how th- recurringly I interact with them. And so on that level, I'm like, this, I, I'm really looking forward to this. So uh-huh. thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. I, I did wonder how my name got picked out of the hat to do this, on the, the famous Pater podcast. Yeah, no. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> I, don't, I don't do the picking. Yeah, oh, so like, yeah, I think okay. I think someone just goes through like the church Rolodex really? and rolls some dice. Okay. And then like that. <laughs> wow. Well, my privilege to be here and share my testimony. Thank you for having me. So, uh, to start off, I got a list of things a little birdie told me about Sandy that she wouldn't advertise about herself. Oh, dear. Okay, that just kind of like lays the groundwork a little bit. That you used to work in children's ministry with Mm -hmm. Sarah Herman back Mm -hmm. in the day. That you're, uh, I guess, a very behind-the-scenes helper and... uh, (laughs) For example, you once noticed the children's trash cans were dirty and so scrubbed them clean. <laughs> you once noticed the backs of the chairs in oh. the Life Center Sanctuary were dirty, so you took it upon oh, yourself to clean every single that, one. Somebody caught that, You used to own a cleaning business also back in the day and would sometimes clean people's homes for free if you knew they were in a hard spot financially. Mm-hmm. And you and your husband were both in charge of organizing the Christmas tree tags for the children in Mexico for yes. a long time, too. Yes. Um, so those are all true statements. Those are true. Okay. <laughs> still doing the cleaning. <laughs> oh, you are. You still I clean. St- that business. is what I do. Yeah, that's okay. been. My, I've been doing that for years. Getting close to retiring, but okay. still, still do it. Uh-huh. So I primarily interact with you and your husband as two of like my faithful Christmas carolers yeah. <laughs> each year, um, as we visit right. and bring gift bags to to people going through difficult times in yes. our church family. Um, so I want to fill in a whole bunch of gaps here mm-hmm. first. Uh, when did you come to faith in Jesus, and just kind of how did that come about? Well, I could I could give you the one minute version of the what, when, where, and how. Um, but if I could, I I'd, I'd like to give you the little bit longer yeah. version. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it it would certainly give you an idea of where, what I came out of and what the Lord brought me into. So if I could share that. Yeah, please. Um, I was uh, to start out. I was I am the middle of three kids. 
I have a brother that's a year and a half younger, a sister that is a year and a half older, and we were not raised in a Christian home. We were uh, raised in a very dysfunctional and broken home. Hmm. And uh, as were both my parents uh, were also, and uh, um, they had at least these two things in common. They both had served in the armed forces. My mother was a wave in the uh, Navy for a, a short time and then got out when my sister, several months before my sister was born. And then my dad served eight years in the Army and then switched over to about 12, 12 and a half years with the Marines. And uh, they were abusive to each other, mm. and they were uh, abusive to us kids. Mm. And uh, because the other thing they had in common was the fact that they were both alcoholics from pretty early on. So that can be pretty destructive in a home life. Yeah. So it wasn't a great start. Um, but then when, my, when I turned about seven years old, my dad had received orders that he was going to be going to Okinawa for two years. And uh, so our family got stationed in uh, the Waimanelo um, area of the uh, Hawaii, Oahu, Hawaii. And, but we would only be there for about nine months. And then my dad had gotten word that he needed to come home and take care of his family. Uh, he, and you got permission to come home. Uh, his, my wi- or his, his wife, my mother, was being unfaithful and she was, being, um, she was not fit and neglectful and taking care of us kids. So he came home, took us, brought us home stateside to Chicago, and we moved into an apartment. And his mother, my grandmother, moved in and would take care of us while uh, he went back to finish his time in Okinawa. Okay. So then, um, when, uh, when he finished that, he came home, brought us all, took us over to the Oceanside area of California, uh, living in Camp Pendleton, so a base there. And uh, then um, we would be there for about two to three years, and then have. Uh, then he got out of the service. My grandmother had passed away, having been with us for four years, and then he decided to move us up to Maryville, Arizona, so on the other side of Phoenix, and that would be for just just a summer. And then uh, he couldn't find good work, or for whatever other reasons, moved us up to Illinois, northern Illinois, uh, north of Chicago. And that's where my life starts to take a turn then, because... How old were you at this point now? At that time, I'm going into uh, sixth grade. Okay. So um, school year was starting. I started sixth grade. I met and was befriended by a gal named Chris Segrin, and she um, invited me to her church, and she, uh, uh, her parents would pick me up every Sunday and take me to church with them, and then, and, and my dad didn't mind me going, and I was the only one going, and uh, then in addition to that, I was um, attending a young girl's I think it was a weeknight group called GMG, Girls Missionary Guild. Okay. And that was led by Chris's mom, that mm. friend that befriended me. And so she had pulled me aside one night and presented the gospel that uh, Jesus loves me and that he died for my sins and that he um, had a purpose for me and that uh, I could have a personal relationship with him. And then one day live with him in heaven. And is that something I wanted? And and yes, it was. I was very easy converted, hmm. and it just made sense to me at that age. And uh, and maybe with what I was hearing, you know, uh, starting to attend church there. So then, uh, fast forward a couple of years to the end of my eighth grade, and then uh, my dad had. Uh, become unfit um, to take care of us. And I guess I needed to backtrack. Um, I I forgot to mention a thing. When my dad had, uh, you know, left our mom in in Hawaii and brought us stateside, we wouldn't see her again. And uh, so never heard from her. I mean, we did hear that she at one time had married again and had Mm -hmm. two boys, but we didn't have any connection with her. So anyways, uh, back to eighth grade. Now my dad had been drinking that much more and was that much worse condition Mm -hmm. and was unfit to take care of us kids. And so we got taken away from him through the state and placed into foster care. Wow. Wow. And, um, 
I would be there for all four years of my high school. And then I went off to one year at Bethel College in St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. My brother would be there for this same duration of time, except that at one point then um, our foster parents were retiring. They were older and they were retiring. And so they moved to um, Florida and they knew it wasn't fair to take him away from his friends uh, and school and church because he had started coming to church and he too uh, was was saved mm. and came to know Jesus. So he went into still another foster care. And um, so that's kind of how I came to know the Lord. And, and all that to say that, um, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And when you can look back and see how God has worked things out in your life, um, uh, he was so good to me. And uh, when I was about six years old, and I don't remember this, but I know I have a paperwork that says I was presented that I had gone to a VBS. So obviously it heard about Jesus even at age six. Mm. I just don't remember mm -hmm. much about it. And then, but when I was that seven-year-old living with our mom in Hawaii, um, my brother, sister, and I often had to sit in the bars, in the, a booth, sitting in a bar, waiting for mom to be ready to go home. Mm. And then scared to death to go home because she was drunk. Mm. And, you know, would we make it home? At that time, I remember, I don't remember a lot about my youth, but I remember praying to God then, you know, help, you know, keep us safe and get us home. And we made it. And then, you know, uh, certainly when we left her, I, I'm sure I was praying at that time. But then again, specifically remember praying when I was in sixth grade. And, um, or excuse me, uh, not sixth grade, uh, when my grandmother had passed away. So that would have been like fifth grade or somewhere in there, fifth going on sixth. And um, I remember going in, sitting in my backyard and just asking God to take care of us. Mm. And so I was, God was pursuing me all up, you know, till then. And then when I was in uh, sixth grade, um, you know, that was not a, a coincidence that I met Chris out of all those students at school and in that classroom I met Chris and she invited me to uh, church and um, her mother leading me to the Lord and then my brother coming to the church and all that so not an accident God was working in my life and, and working that out and then <clears throat> excuse me and then when we went to and then again in eighth grade when we could no longer live with our dad by then, it, my, it was primarily just my brother and I, because my sister had dropped out of high school early okay. and then got married. So she was kind of out of the picture. Um, but um, again, not a, it was just, it wasn't just any families that we, you know, got into foster care with. Um, there were three families that I recall from that church, Bonnie Brook Baptist, that were willing to take my brother and I in mm. and our dog. Wow. <laughs> and, um, and I had a little bit of a say in who that would be because I knew them. Mm -hmm. And I chose Uncle Chuck and Aunt Lillian. That's what we called them. And um, mainly because they had an older son who was of age and moving out of the house really soon. So we moved in with them and just an incredible, lovely family who uh, loved the Lord, who lived their faith, mm -hmm. who loved on us and, um, and really just built us up. You know, and you can have a foster dad that can say things like, um, gee, I think you're terrific or I think you're great or thank you for today, you know, things like that, mm. you know, to just make you feel really special. Yeah. And um, so we lived, uh, you know, so we were with them. And like I said, I was with them for about four years. Um, so God provided them for us. And then mm. when my, and then when they moved to Florida uh, and it left my brother going into still another uh, foster home, um, it was a doctor and his wife and their four kids, and my brother became their big brother. Hmm. And to this day is very much a part of their family. Wow. And so God was taking care of him and giving him good influence. And so them along with, gosh, many others, my dearest friend Karen, who I've known since sixth grade, met her through Chris. 
Um, her and her family embraced me and prayed for me, prayed for our family, uh, other men and women at Bonnie Brook who um, just really set an example of how a husband and wife should love each other mm. and how they should love their kids and train up their kids. And um, so they were huge in my life and just recently lost a couple of them. Mm. Um, but that's okay. I'll see them in heaven. And um, so, but very, very important people in my life and very um very much used in shaping who I am today. Wow! So that's that's kind of uh, you know where where God had. I can I think I can truly say and claim you know Romans eight twenty eight that does say that God works all things together for good to them that love Him, to them that are called according to His purpose. And I knew from early on just embracing him so early in my young life when I wasn't even going to church I was talking to him uh, but he just uh, you know was bring, drawing him me to himself and uh, then when I came to know him he was just making things better for me and brought me to that point where I had purpose and he's still working out that purpose in my life this many years hmm. this many years later Wow. So, uh, so that's... So you must have such a, a particular perspective on what it means to have a church family. Mm, definitely. You know, I mean, because of, <clears throat> because of just uh, the family that developed around you made up of yeah. believers. Um, that's really interesting. And now for so long, you've been so active in this church family. Yeah. So I want to hear like how you first found yourself at RMCC. Well, for, first of all, I would say that yes, the church did become my family. It became my second family, my better family. Mm. You know, and I, I always am very careful to say that, you know, it, it would be easy to say, you know, why did, you know, I would have liked a better family, mm. a better parents. Uh, but you know, God, before I was born, knew who I was going to be born into. And those are the parents he gave me uh, that would help shape my life mm. for his purpose. And so, you know, I still need to be thankful for, for them. Mm. And I've always had, to some extent, have been respectful of who my dad was, um, you know, and had opportunity to tell him about Jesus. He wasn't always receptive. Mm -hmm. and could be downright mean and ugly about it. But mm. anyway... Yes, the church became my family and my loving family. And um, but yeah, as far as coming to Red Mountain, Walt and I have been here for been in Mesa, Arizona, for about 34 years. This October, uh, when we first arrived here, we were attending um, what was then Desert View Baptist Church off of 60 in Greenfield. Okay. It's now a Redeemer Church. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's where we were at for nine years. Um, and then we, you know, for reasons, came over here to Red Mountain. We were familiar with Red Mountain Community Church because their young, their youth, their uh, children's program had did some things with us in the summer, like a mus some musicals. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was head up by Nancy Braun yep. and Deb Fox. So those were incredibly enjoyable, and my kids participated in those. So for us to come to Red Mountain was was an easy, you know, place to, to come and check out, and we love it here. We just, this is, this is our church home. Mm. Yeah. So what are uh, some of the types of ministry that you've enjoyed being a part of here and, and what and the mm -hmm. reasons you've enjoyed them and mm -hmm. that could be either the things that I kind of mentioned at the beginning or yeah. anything else that, that maybe comes to mind well you know I'll, I'll take you um, as best I can remember from what I first started to do when I first came here I actually helped Joe uh, Jim Osick the facilities manager oh, yeah. then uh -huh. briefly just a short time just coming in and doing some janitorial cleaning cleaning up and just help, assisting him and then, you know, I did get involved with uh, child care. Did that for a number of years. Yeah, I remember usually that. Usually on the weeknight programs. I've had your kids. Mm -hmm. And um, and then uh, I did become the uh, child care coordinator. Uh, did that for almost seven years. Um, and then um, have served as a, um, I think it was the third grade uh, elementary uh, Sunday school teacher. Walt and I were doing that together for a while. And then... Um, Oh goodness! What else? Um, 
Yeah, and then besides serving on the uh, the Mexico missions trip to build the homes, Walt and I had did that several times, serving in that. Okay. And then the uh, then the um, Mexico children's Christmas gifts. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were doing that for an, several years now, and uh, and then um, oh goodness, um, yeah, and then the Christmas caroling, and I think in each one of those, it was uh, just finding real joy in serving whether it was teaching the kids about Jesus and and then of course seeing that come to fruition when you see a lot of these kids that I watched in childcare growing up mm. and now serving in some way within the church and uh, and just seeing how God is using them so that's pretty incredible um, and then you know uh, serving on the you know just in different other areas, you know, on the missions and knowing that you're helping um, people who maybe wouldn't have. Um, and I've seen that carry over into even my work, mm. uh, how I can serve in, in helping them uh, in different ways. So, yeah, I think that's... Well, I would I would add, too, uh-huh. that you are somebody who really serves with practical needs mm. with people. Because I always hear from you when you're concerned about someone, mm. and you know, can we bring meals? Can we help them in some way? Yeah. Um, those are things that stand out to me. Yeah. And if someone's new to the church, you're someone. <clears throat> you and your husband both will go sit with that person mm. and find out about them, mm. and just yeah. really be an encouragement to them. Yeah. I. You know. I, that's important in my life. I think, um, and I think maybe one of the questions that you had, pre- you know, told me that we might have was that um, I think that's kind of helps when you know what your gifts are, hmm. and um, I think that's kind of why I have served in the areas that I have. Um, and I think it's huge when you come to know the Lord. You know, we know that before you know the Lord, many people are born with talents. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're given certain spiritual gifts when you come to know Jesus and you know he he reveals those to you and and I've always felt in taking a class many many years ago that that mine were in the way of helps and um, um, to some extent mercy and hospitality Mm. service Mm -hmm. and uh, and again that just kind of carries over into the type of work that I do and and what I've done around the church so, um, what would you describe as maybe some thoughts or, or feelings that kind of um, motivate mm. uh, your service? You, you talked a little bit about kind of the things that you enjoy, mm-hmm. but those aren't necessarily the same thing as motivation, mm-hmm. um, and so, but maybe they are. So, what, how would you describe that in your case, the, the, the thoughts or feelings that, yeah. that lead you to, to say to yourself, I'm going to do that? Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think part of it has to do with um, knowing that I am part of the body, and that everybody needs to be functioning hmm. <laughs> with the body, and then and sometimes it just has to do with um, you know somebody that recognizes something in me and that approached me, you know, uh, and thought you know, hey Sandy, I think this would be something that you would be good at doing, hmm. and so I was simply asked and. Um, so, and then, you know, praying about it and just getting a sense, having a sense that, you know, yes, the Lord's leading me in that direction. And, and, and I, I strongly encourage that anybody that's asked to do something that they don't just turn it down. Like when I got this request to do the podcast, <laughs> my first thought was like, oh, no, I, no, 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 I can't do you that. Just, you just didn't picture yourself doing that. No. And, but, you know, it really... I very quickly changed my mind and said, you know, I can do that. I, I do enjoy sharing my testimony. I don't have a problem with that. Um, and I love hearing how others come to know Jesus mm-hmm. and come to faith in him. And um, I think I was just more afraid of your questions, Peter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but yeah, so I think just... Um, That's why we, for, for any future potential guests, if you, <laughs> if you get the call or, or the email, I do give you the questions yeah. in advance uh, and make sure that you are okay with them or if you have any questions or thoughts. So don't be scared when we come a-knocking. 
<laughs> that, that does help. But, um, but yeah, so mainly uh, what motivated me was, again, wanting to be part of the body, uh, feeling that nudge from the spirit, and, and, and whether it was through somebody bringing it to my attention. And, you know, sometimes you find out maybe it's not um, what necessarily what you wanted to do or feel like you wanted to continue, but, you know, it's, it's serving in that time and then wherever else God leads you to. Um, and then, you know, you, you get to see great reward from it, and we know, certainly know there's spiritual reward in um, stepping up and serving Jesus, uh, certainly for eternity, but you, you do see that here and now, like I said, in these kids, if you've had any impact on them, in seeing um, where they're at in their walk with the Lord. And so there's, there's just reward in uh, being motivated and serving the Lord uh, in, in different ways. And, um, yeah. Now, you know, you mentioned just the, the gift of hindsight and just mm. kind of like how valuable mm-hmm. that is. So I, I wonder if there are moments or maybe seasons in your life that you look back on now and, and kind of see how your, uh, your faith was uh, influenced or, or your heart was shaped in some way to lead you to the kinds of service that you're doing now. Oh, goodness. Um, yes. Um, certainly it was certainly it was the people that God had placed in my life. You know, I think each one of these brings different people in and out of your life that have great influence on you. Mm-hmm. And again, I would refer back to those men and women who, in my first church where I was saved, um, I, I observed it in them. Mm-hmm. I saw them serving the Lord in different ways. Um, and so that impacted me and encouraged me uh, to, to serve him. Um, uh, yeah, I'm trying, trying to think what else. Um, ways that influenced me. Um, you know, and I would also say that, um, again, just Jesus coming into my life and seeing how he served. Mm. And my gosh, you know, if the king of kings and the lord of lords is willing to serve then certainly i should be and each one of us should be willing to to serve Mm. in some way and um so you know certainly uh the impact that jesus had and again with those gifts that he gives us um did that answer that yeah yeah and i'm also interested um you know i mean you talk about the things that you enjoy from serving and investing and the rewards mm-hmm. in that, but it does take something from us mm-hmm. to give and to serve. And so mm-hmm. uh, two questions along those lines. The first one is, um, in what ways do you think God has ministered to you or blessed you or helped you while you are in the process of, of serving other people? Oh, um you know, I think, um, oh gosh, what was it? Um, tell me that question one more time. Yeah, yeah. Just the idea of like, um, have you noticed any ways that God has ministered to you or held you up or propelled you or given you what you needed while you are helping and serving others? Well, I think just again, having, um, seeing the impact that you can have on others whose lives you influence. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and just seeing how God can use you to further His work and uh, come alongside someone who's needing encouragement, who's just needing prayer support, who's needing um, just a friend, hmm. and someone who's just, um, you know, uh, if they're new and making them feel welcome. Um, yeah. So it sounds like in some in some ways the just the re, the rewards the enjoyment yeah. the fulfillment mm-hmm. is in itself a kind of a sustaining thing it is. for you. It is. Yes. Um yeah, I I think that's huge. Um and I've had a number of people that, you know, have appreciated, you know, um me befriending them mm. and uh and it just helps me to grow uh in my relationship with the Lord. And uh, and then again, uh, being used by him to serve him uh, f- with others, mm. and uh, and you know, and sometimes it's just this is where God can 
make something good. He can use my life, what I've come out of, and be encouraging to somebody else that maybe has experienced the yeah. same the same things. Yeah, he or, uses us to comfort others yeah. where he has comforted mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. see that in your life yeah. quite a bit. Oh, thank it's you. like you have experienced that, and so... It's like it seems like there's a lot of joy for you to pass mm-hmm. it on to other people, and you do that very naturally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, you know, different people react differently to their their uh, circumstances in life. Um, I don't know. I, I have such. I like to think that I have such dependence on God that it all happens for a reason, mm. and that can again, as Romans eight twenty eight, that God can take it and turn it around and make something really good out of it. And, you know, if I could, um, there is like a part B to my testimony because, as I said, I didn't know um, my mother after age seven. And as I said, she did marry again. She had two kids. We had heard that she, um, well, actually, we'd received a letter. My sister had received a letter um, back in 2013 from an uncle, a, a brother of hers, Never knew him, hmm. never knew any of her family or her parents, and she was one of five kids. Hmm. And this fella explained who he was and wanted to um, reconnect with us and be part of our lives. Hmm. And so, uh, and if we wanted that, he wanted it. And so, my sister and I did get in touch with him. We, you know, emailed, we phone conversations, and then we made that decision to go out and meet him in Aiken, South Carolina. And so we we bought our tickets, all ready to go. About a week or two before we went there, he passed away. Oh. Did Aww. not get to meet Aww. him. That was so disappointing. Mm-hmm. But we went anyways, and we met um, his wife and his two stepdaughters. And then from there, same visit, we got to meet his sister. So it would be an aunt of mine. Mm. And they lived across the border in Georgia. And they welcomed uh, welcomed us into their home with great Southern hospitality. And then we've communicated through these years, although my aunt and her husband have recently passed away. So we don't have that anymore and don't have him anymore. But... um, uh, but we did find out in our dialogue with this uncle that he too was a believer, mm. and I like to think he had some testimony with her. Uh, uh, we did find out that she had passed away. My mother had passed away in 1994. Okay. Sadly, her drinking had only worsened through her years, and she ended up on the streets of Hawaii. Oh picked up, taken to the hospital, and died at the hospital. And even that husband and two boys would not claim her. And so she was just um, just kind of abandoned. Mm. And yeah. word got to this uncle, her brother, that what do we do with her remains? And he had them sent to him in South Carolina. And she was buried at um, a local cemetery there uh, in an unmarked, simple white cross and we got to go visit that when we were out there and um, so I know it we were told by him that she had been in a halfway house uh, for women I like to think that maybe the gospel was presented at some point be it through her brother or through there that maybe she did come to know Jesus or at some point Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know but my dad who recently had passed away in February uh, of this year, Um, he was, you know, not doing, he was in and out of rehab a lot, and he ended up um, um, about two weeks before he passed away, I had received a phone call um, from the hospital saying that he, or actually from the center, the nursing care facility that he was at, that he was probably not going to be around much longer. I panicked. Mm. And I just thought, oh my gosh, he does not know Jesus that I'm aware of. And so I called up to that church that I was saved at, different pastor now, and I asked him, Pastor Steve, would you please, please, and I'm out here in Arizona, would you please go and visit my dad at the hospital and present the gospel to him? Mm. 
even if it seems like he's not conscious, just please present it to him and allow the spirit to to work. And he went. I mean, he went like that next day. And then he called me back, um, I think the following day, and said that he had talked with my dad, that he had prayed with my dad, and that my dad squeezed his hand, acknowledging, you know, um, that he had prayed with him. And um, so he, he tells me he did receive Jesus. Mm. And he then went back a day or so later and to meet up with my dad again. And my dad did acknowledge him when he walked in the room. Mm. So remembering that he was there. Yeah. And so I'm trusting that my dad is in heaven. Mm-hmm. And um, wow, what a, what a much different person he, he would be. Yeah. And I hope yeah. to see him there. So again, huge how the church impacted me, how God uh, used people to influence me to have um, that drive to witness to him and allow someone else maybe to bring him to that point. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. So I just really wanted you to know how, how that whole yeah. story yeah, I'm ended. so glad that you shared that with us. Yeah. Because so many of us don't know mm-hmm. like about our loved ones mm-hmm. or friends. Mm-hmm. And to know how far God would go to make sure that happens. And that he uses us to do that, Mm -hmm. too. Hmm. And how you rested that with him. Yes, yes. So, I don't know. We'll see. But uh, So, you know, again, part of that, just having concern that he would know the Lord and just reaching out and asking someone, you know, just please go and present the gospel. And, you know, and then I have that now in my life to, you know, having served with the kids and presenting the gospel and the Bible stories, um, people that I work with who not, aren't, are not all believers, but, you know, and I'm not an aggressive person that would, you know, uh, you know, pound Jesus on them, but, yeah. um, but that you try to live that out in your life. And as you have opportunity to um, tell them what God has done in your life, and, you know, they say something and somehow you can point out, you know, that, oh, yeah, you know, this is what God has done in, in my life and mm. where my life came from and what, what, how, what God brought me, you know, out of and brought me into a, relation, a personal relationship. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So as, as someone that is uh, kind of wired and gifted to, to serve, to, to, to see needs and to look to meet those needs, um, how do you like, uh, how do you rest and keep mm. yourself from like, cause I can see that, uh, you know, a person wired that way, mm. just kind of giving and giving and giving mm. and not realizing suddenly that, that they, they have nothing left mm-hmm. and kind of just burning out and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so what in that, in that realm have you kind of discovered or figured out for yourself is healthy? You know, Peter, I don't think I've really ever felt overwhelmed and, you know, I think at, at maybe an example would be when I was maybe doing the uh, child care coordinator position because you were constantly, you know, uh, preparing for a, an event or, mm-hmm. um, you know, providing child care for something and you're seeking people to help serve. Not my strong point to ask people to, to do something, mm-hmm. you know, um, which is kind of silly because I don't mind being asked. But anyways, um, <laughs> but I'll do, I'll do it first before I put anybody else out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so that was probably be a time in my life where I might have felt that, you know, it could be a little draining Mm -hmm. and that, you know, you needed to certainly have that encouragement from others, uh, certainly from the the church staff that I know they would frequently, you know, when we'd have our meetings to, you know, build us up and encourage us and, and, you know, and I worked for a wonderful team with the children's ministry and um, a shout out to all of those that I had worked with, you know who you are. just a delightful group of people uh, to work with. And um, um, so, yeah, just, um, so I, I, you know, I guess, uh, yeah, like I said, I haven't, I'm not experiencing anything that drains me. I don't feel overwhelmed by people that, Mm -hmm. that are, I'm investing in their life or uh, have relationships with. It's just, um, yeah. So I, I, I don't, think I can answer that any differently. Um, just not overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Maybe God needs to overwhelm me. That's I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what would you say maybe to someone um, who, you know, wants to serve 
their community in some way, but mm -hmm. just doesn't know kind of like where to start or how to start, but they're kind of feeling that, mm -hmm. that draw. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, um, I think first, um, help, helpful to know your gifts, to know where you, you tend to have a, a bent towards. And then secondly, just simply contacting the church, you know, you know, center, you know, the, uh, uh, and talking, be it, if you're interested in kids, talking with Becky Bibelheimer and Sarah Herman, um, you know, or in the admin group or anyway, you know, somebody could direct you to who maybe there are some definite needs hmm. that the church is needing to meet and they can kind of direct you. I mean, that's how I came across even the child care coordinator position. Uh, at that time, Diane uh, Selaski, you know, and said, you know, hey, Sandy, this is a position that's opening that I think, you know, you should consider. And so, uh, so just kind of, you know, contacting any one of the, you know, an elder, you know, or the admin center, uh, Preston, and just finding out what ways that are out there to serve. And there's numerous ones, you know, be it with, um, you know, uh, elementary kids or um, high school or uh, just, you know, just in any, any, any uh, area. You so I, and then just and then certainly just um, talking to God about it and um, finding out and and just listening for you know uh, hit where He might and sometimes sometimes that can come through someone, mm -hmm. you know, someone influencing you and He can use other people to direct you to where you can serve. Mm -hmm. You know, Sandy, something I heard you mention I think is important, too, is that often we'll start serving in, in a place, and that might be the ministry that God expands for mm -hmm. us, but it might be just kind of a stepping stone, mm -hmm. or it might be that, oh, you know, this is not quite it, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the important thing is just to start, and you had said that yeah. you in the past have done things like that, and mm -hmm. just like, oh, you learn more as you go on. Yeah, yeah, you know, I find, for me, I mean, mine's maybe not so much an obvious um, ministry per se right now, uh, but it's meeting people, uh, people that I've come to know that have just a pew warmer, as you would put it, mm. Peter, you know, somebody <laughs> that sits around me and, um, you know, and I think that's where sort of the hospitality, not so much that I entertain in my home but that you reach out and want to welcome new people hmm. and make them feel welcome and I have found that I have met several friends in that way and just simply turning around and, and welcoming them and um, you know getting to know them trying to remember their name which can you know be a good thing a plus to uh, let them know that they're welcome um, so yeah just um, different ways that God can um, Reveal uh, what his purpose is in my life, in your life, and uh, you know, for a time it was working with childcare, and it's not to say that I can't help in that. As you know, again, uh, it's just that God has uh, allowed me to have some relationships with other people that I've come to know and come alongside of and pray for, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and just be a friend. Mm -hmm. Our ministry is often right where God puts us. Mm -hmm. It's like we come to church and we've asked the Lord, you know, just direct me to the people mm -hmm. that you'd like for me to speak to. Right, right. You know, he does use us in that way, and mm -hmm. I know he does for you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been great. This has very uh, been very nice for me to kind of get, just yeah. on a selfish level, to kind of get some gaps filled in and yeah. to see uh, some of your life and just kind of what you've experienced. So yeah. thank you very much for doing this. Well, thank you. And again, Peter, thank you for what you do with this, because I do, I thoroughly enjoy hearing from the people, the many that you have already interviewed. And we all come from such different different walks of life yeah. and, uh, and just amazing how God brings us to that point of, of faith in Him and, and I'm thankful. So that was, um, I mean, just a different story that I, I, it's not that I expected a certain type of story, but I wouldn't have guessed that story. You I know. wouldn't have guessed that either. Just looking at who Sandy is today yeah. and um, who she is in the church and how she serves and uh, just her merciful and encouraging spirit. Yeah, yeah. Is there maybe something in particular from our time talking to Sandy that, that stands out to you? How God worked in her life through the church. Yeah. 
you know, her life could have gone so differently, but he was there at each step, providing Christian homes, providing a church, providing people who would speak life mm-hmm. into her. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's basically the same thing that stood out to me is that just like how God brought people into her life that somehow shaped her in ways that overcame Mm -hmm. what she came from prior to that, which is just stunning to me that God can do that. Right. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. well, anyway, that that's about it, I think, for this episode of the Red Mountain Community Church podcast. You can follow Red Mountain Community Church on Instagram and Facebook, where you can also leave us comments and sub- suggestions, is the word I was looking for, to help make the show better. Also, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening so you don't miss out on the next episode. Dang it, I forgot to tell you about this part. I'm going to say my name, and then after that, you say, and I'm Della Zwick, okay? Okay. It goes like <laughs> this. In the meantime... I'm Peter Franson. And I'm Della Zwick. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on Sunday.